Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I've got a little extra energy. I don't know where it came from, but I've got some extra energy. I'm so probably probably because of the amazing guest we have tonight. I cannot believe we we were able to get her to come on. Uh, and I will say more about who she is and how I met her and encountered her uh, in just a second. But that's probably that probably has a whole lot to do with the energy I have. I cannot wait for you all to hear from her tonight. I can't believe we get to interview her tonight. The own, My biggest disappointment is that Pastor Yolanda and Kyle, Pastor Kyle, will not be with us tonight. They're both on vacation. And we were going to have Dr. Shauna Mascheco on as our guest co-host, but she's got a sick child. So we are praying for Shauna and her family as they heal. I don't know what the nature of the illness, but we're praying for her. So it's just uh, it's me and Kai tonight, my 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 good friend, Kai, who's in Austin, Texas. And so let me bring him on and let him greet you guys. What's going on, bro? Hey, what's going on, man? Uh, super <laughs> excited to be here. I feel like you were up there and I came in like super mellow. My bad. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just that Austin, Texas vibe. But uh, I do just want to tell everybody, please, you know, uh, take a moment to like, share all the good stuff on all your social media channels. I know we see it every week. We have an amazing guest. But truly, people, in Robert's word, we have an amazing guest, okay? Or in my phrase, we have someone today that's going to help you cultivate your curiosity. Y'all know how much I like to say that in the church, right? We want to think. We want to be moving people of power, but people that also know how to steward their privilege, okay? And I think that we've got someone that's going to be with us here tonight that can help us tap into that and help us understand the intersection of faith and politics. So listen, it's important that we tune in. So like, share, get some people on this feed. Make sure to drop your questions below. We'll make sure that we ask them and that we engage with you. So please, please, please support us out here tonight. Let's get this engagement up. Let's have a good time. Absolutely. Thank you, Kai. As a matter of fact, if you're on my page, I, I have it on my page, but I, I would prefer that you go to the St. Mark Facebook page so yeah. that when you post comments, we'll see them. If you post on my profile, we will not see those comments. We need you to go to the St. Mark Facebook Facebook page or YouTube channel, and then we will see your comments because we want to get your interaction with us tonight. I know you're going to have questions for our guests. You're going to want to pluck her, uh, just, just probe her mind and her thoughts on issues beyond our planned conversation, our structured yeah. conversation, and we want to give you a chance to do that. Kai, thank you so much. By the way, if you're looking for some workout tips, you need to go <laughs> visit Kai's. Uh, Instagram profile. He's uh, some stuff on there. As a matter of fact, I I saw some stuff that that I'm I I was I thought I was doing what I saw him doing that <laughs> I've been doing all wrong. Like and so I'm like I'm so glad I didn't post what I do at home because Kai would have laughed at it and the rest of you guys would have laughed at it. Go to Kai's profile so you can see not just what to do, but how to do it properly. You see how well structured he is. Newly married, great job. Theology student, just got it all going on. <laughs> let, me tell you, let me tell you like they, no, no, y'all know I'm from Arkansas. So let me tell you the reason, because somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. Oh, Mama Helen, y'all know my family back home. Y'all know Aunt Helen prayed for everybody. She held me down. <laughs> and hey, folks, uh, if you're on, say hello. Uh, so, we, you know, we like to give shout outs as we go along. But so let me let's let's prepare to bring on our guests. I Absolutely. met her. I met her. I didn't meet her. I experienced her ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you all know, Kayla, our youngest daughter, just graduated from Spelman. Uh, and they did a baccalaureate. They did a the regular commencement service on Sunday. On Saturday, they did a baccalaureate service. And our guest speaker, uh, Bishop Leah D. Daughtry, was the speaker. And she came out and electrified that audience. I saw folks there that I know that that they probably were not church folks, but the message was so powerful. And it was so wholesome and it was so broad. I mean, she dealt with politics. She dealt with basic faith issues. My mom, who's 81, who's an evangelist. I hope my mom's watching because my mom told me she she was so excited about getting a chance to hear uh, 
a bishop doctor again. My mom <laughs> was just like she like was just ling lingering on every word. Wow. It was inspirational. It was enlightening. And then she spoke. As a matter of fact, thank you, Felicia. Felicia Johnson was there. Felicia is a good friend of our fa family. Felicia was there. Yes, indeed. So powerful. Yes, Felicia, it was. My family, we're still talking about it. She dealt with all these issues. But then Kai, like the exegesis of the text, the creativity, cultivate. You talk about cultivating curiosity. She had cultivated curiosity about the text and brought that out. And then she's the way she spoke to women. Uh, it was the most powerful message I'd ever heard about making room, make room, uh, making space, making room. And she dealt with that issue about how women have to carve their way in a world that's dominated by patriarchy and so many other issues that women have to fight through. And she, she, it was just amazing. And so the students, the, uh, the families of the students were there and we were just electrified. It was just absolutely amazing. Stacey Abram, the, the, the fabulous Stacey Abram spoke on Sunday and she was amazing. She always is. And I have such great respect for her. And I'm pray for her daily because I love, I, I so deeply appreciate the burden she's taken on as a, in our country. But I got to tell you the highlight of that weekend, uh, was Bishop Leah Daughtry. And so I immediately knew that I was going to do whatever it took to try to get her on. So I, she doesn't know this, but I actually start stalking her, trying to find an email address, trying to find something to get to her. And so, Kai, please don't. I'm, this is going to embarrass you. So when this embarrasses you, Kai, you probably going to want to like, oh. go off screen. Let me just oh. tell you, like oh. I, I went on Twitter and like. But she responded, she responded and I was like, wow. <laughs> so I went to my wife went to Linda and said, uh, Bishop Daughtry responded and she said she'll do the interview. And so here we are. So let's bring her on, Bishop, the, the great Bishop. Right. We gotta we gotta start incorporating sound effects. So we need a crowd. Yeah. We, do. we do, we do, we gotta bring especially we should have especially had a, a, a sound effect for tonight. Yes. I'm telling you, I'm yes. telling you. Uh, uh, Bishop, there's that we are ready. I'm <laughs> excited. Yes. How are you? I am just fine, Brother Pastor. Thank you so much for the invitation. And Brother Kai, I'm so glad to be here and to spend a little time with you. And thank you for your ingenuity. And he, he sent me a DM. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> he sent me a DM on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I did. 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 <laughs> and I was like, "My name is Pastor Robert Dross." I said, "Okay, okay, man of God, let me read this <laughs> and respond with respect and with kindness, because he's a man of God trying to do what God told him to do." So I said, let me let me participate. Uh, in, the, I, in the work uh, man that God is trying to do. And, and I am not going to own a bit of the manipulation that I was doing. In that. <laughs> Most people say he doesn't like to use them reverend titles, but I use my re I think I may have called myself the great <laughs> Dr. Reverend Bishop <laughs> Johnson in that deal. Just uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there's my wife. She's laughing. She's probably embarrassed, but she's like that. But thank you oh, for reading and responding. Yes, she is. Yes. Yes. Hey, there you go. I see the pink and green hearts. Right. Yes, indeed. Right. Yes. We didn't even, yeah, Robert, we forgot to mention that this is this this broadcast is is also being uh let's see, uh facilitated by Alpha Phi Alpha and uh Alpha Kappa Alpha. Hello, everybody. The brothers and the sisters. <laughs> now, those of you that are in, in the other fraternities and sororities, we love you. You're doing an right. awesome job. So please don't. Mom, mom and dad love all their children. <laughs> Absolutely. And in in the words of one of my petty cousins, and, and all that stuff is cute. It's really, really cute. It's cute. It's not. <laughs> Kai, you're going to get us in trouble here. You're going to get us in trouble. <laughs> you didn't know Pastor. Jesus paid it all. I just. He did. He did. He did. Oh, my own. 
there, there, there's a Delta over there saying, hey, it's all over. And then there's there's your Sarah shout shout out back to you. Uh, let me tell you all about this amazing person. Uh, Bishop Leah Daughtry is a nationally recognized organizer, activist, political strategist, author, faith leader. She serves as the presiding prelate of the House of the Lord Churches. Uh, Bishop Daughtry is principal on these things, uh, a strategic planning and project management firm that builds and supports partnerships that advance the common good. She is also a convener of the Power Rising, which brings together black women and girls to leverage their power for the benefit of their communities. Standing at the intersection of faith and politics, Daughtry has served as chief of staff for the U.S. Department of Labor and the National Democratic Party, as well as CEO of the 2008 and 2016 Democratic National Conventions. <coughs> are the only person in the Democratic Party to hold a position twice. For her work with communities of faith, Religion News Service named her one of the dozen most effective Democrats in the nation on faith and values politics. She is co-author of the NAACP Image Award for 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 colored color girls who have considered politics, uh, mm -hmm. which is a book we're going to talk to her about that book in just a moment. The daughter of a long line of community organizer activists, Leah represents the fifth consecutive generation of clergy persons. Wow in the Daughtry family. A native of Brooklyn, New York, she is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Wesley <clears throat> Theological Seminary. Wow. Bishop, thank you again for coming on and welcome Yay. to Ignite <laughs> St. Mark and uh, we're ready to get started. So yeah. first question, how are you doing these days and, and what are you working on right now? I am, uh, well, of course, again, thank you for the invitation and I am so happy to be here and look forward to the conversation. Uh, these days I am uh, uh, well mo uh, mentally and spiritually. Uh, I am also distressed and vexed by what is happening in our country with uh, this newly uh, uh, conservative activist Supreme Court and the decisions that they are rendering now daily uh, has me uh, very concerned about our future as a nation and as a people in these United States. And of course, you know, the, the daily gun violence and our inability as a nation to forthrightly deal with the matter of gun violence, which I, all of that, I hope we'll get into this, has a spiritual root, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and, and we saw it exposed during COVID, the lack of grace, the lack of compassion, the lack of care for our neighbors, and really the flaunting of the, the commandment to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, it, it's just out the window. So nobody wants to wear a mask, nobody wants to get vaccinated, just, uh, and all of that is selfishness. Come on. Uh, and, and so you see the gun, people are angry, so I'm just gonna go shoot up a school. People are angry, so I'm just gonna have road rage. People are angry, mm -hmm. so I'm just gonna talk to people any old kind of way, it has yeah. this root. And in, 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 the, in the language of faith, it's, it's a demonic root. And it's and that concerns me a great deal. So those are the things that I'm thinking about. Ooh, that's uh, good. That's good. Right now. What a great start. What a great start. So so you got so you all see see what she just did is what is this this broad intellectual and spiritual grasp of our times and our realities. Uh, I got to pause, Kai. Yep. Because I've been talking about my mom. There she is. Good evening. Hey, mom. Madam Evette, oh, just to see your picture on screen. Oh, you were such a blessing to her, and we so enjoyed you. So, Kai, there's a question uh, that Kai is going to. Kai, I want to go to that question. The first question we have listed for you. Yeah, yeah. Because I the think, same page. yeah, let's let's let yeah. because I want people to hear like because I think it's it's such a great definition of what she of what Bishop Leah does and how she approaches things. Right. Um, so, and I, and I think it's a good way to, to also begin to open up the conversation based on the response that she just gave. Right. Like we talked about, kind of painting this vision, this perspective that she had. And I do want to point out really quickly, 
I appreciated that uh, she explained that she had this sense of joy, but then spiritually, right? How she was experiencing things. And I think that sometimes too, as Christians, um, it is, it, we, <laughs> I think we feel the weight of all of these things I'm trying, I guess maybe in a sense of like all of our being. And sometimes we don't have the tools, right, to understand our theology, to unpack our beliefs, to unpack our faith, to understand how to balance out that weight. You know, when when we have Jesus and it talks about the fact that he give, he supports us, he gives us strength to overcome. I think that that's one of the important things of being able to kind of break down the theology, break down the faith and understand how to create that sense of balance, though we might have parts of us that are overwhelmed, things that perplex us. So with that, that's a perfect setup to ask her this yeah. question that, uh, Bishop, you are a public theologian. You know, for some circles, all they know is preacher, maybe a teacher, something like that. But you go public theologian. And so I'd like for you to take a moment uh, and help us explore that concept, like help our audience understand what does it mean to be a public theologian? Well, for me, it means that I deal with faith in the public square. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you've heard my bio. I'm a fifth generation pastor. I'm Pentecostal. You know, we go for all night prayer and, you know, we don't have a problem. We run away. We stay in church 10 hours. We love <laughs> church. That's how I was raised when I was in church, you know, every day of the week, except for Monday. And so I have a deep, deep and abiding love for church and over time I've developed my own faith and my own faith, my own relationship with God, not attached to my father's relationship or his father or mm. his father. Mm. Um, so, but, but we operate in the, I operate in the public square. I'm a political figure, a political strategist and activist. And so I have to bring my faith to the work that I do. And I often say I'm not engaged in political activity or strategy because I love it because I don't. Wow. <laughs> I don't, but it's where I'm called mm -hmm. to, be a, to be a moral voice, to under, help folks understand and to bring, take the issues through a lens of what and where is God. Mm -hmm. in this moment. So there's that scripture in Michael that in Micah uh, 6 8, I have shown you a man what is good, uh, to do justice, to love mercy, mm -hmm. to walk humbly with our God. So as a public theologian, my question is where is God walking? Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm walking humbly with my God. Where is that? And how do I help the folks in the public, whether they are public officials or whether they just regular folk, understand mm -hmm. where God is walking in the moment. And how do I interpret the moment for the people so that they will understand, for those who have an ear to listen, where God is walking yes. in the moment? Wow. So some days, if, if, if it was up to me, I'd be home in New York, you know, doing, teaching kids or something, right? But that's right. not where God called me. And so I am where God called me and I do mm -hmm. the work because this is what I'm called to do. Wow. You, uh, and I don't know, Robert, <clears throat> that, that's got me thinking, and maybe Robert, you can say this too. I, I remember uh, when I first kind of entered into this ministry realm, the, the pastor, I, I went to church the next day and said, hey man, I'm supposed to preach. I've been running a long time. And he said, okay, come to my office later in the week. Middle, it was an odd time. I go to his office. I mean, I was there right when I was supposed to be there. He looks at me and he goes, well, why do you want to preach? And I said, well, sir, that's where you're wrong. So I, I don't want to. I, I wish I could just sit on the back pew, give me a little praise and a prayer and like go on. And and I love but I love what she said, because it, I want people to hear that this this calling. Right. When when there's something deposited in you like that, it continues to echo and echo and echo until you really get out there and you start to engage and do that kind of work. So I appreciate that she shared that. And I also love the fact that this whole this this whole landscape that you have. Right. You, you talked about being a public theologian. We know that you're in the intersection of politics, right? You've uh, served with the with the DNC. Uh, you've co-authored a book, and I love the multifacetedness of what it is that you're doing, and and what it means to be this public theologian. Um, a quick follow up question, though, uh, you mentioned that you're helping people too, like find where is God, where is God walking, 
as a public theologian to do you speak to other um, uh, faith systems or is everything in your realm specific to, I would say, westernized Christianity? Or, or you know, in the work that I do, it is very intersectional. So uh, and intentionally so, because I have my faith system and I know what I believe about mm -hmm who God is, where God is, and, and what God is saying, right? But that doesn't, I'm not going to discount someone else's faith system if it, wow. if it is in fact leading them to be faithful in the way that they understand it. Wow. And to, and to, and to do their own walking with God. Wow. In the way that they understand it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you about the name of God or the text that you read. Are mm -hmm. we striving together yes. to bring the beloved community, to bring the kingdom of God or the mm -hmm. reign of God, mm -hmm. uh, to bring those values to bear on earth. So, you know, I, I work with whoever wants to work with me to see the reign of God realized on earth and to see where God is walking and to determine and to articulate where mm -hmm. God is walking, and and when you when you come to that lens, then you say then you say where where would God be? Wow, where do I see God? God is under the bridge with the Haitians. Mm -hmm. God is in the lockup mm -hmm. with, with the with the children who've been separated from their parents. God is with the folks in prison, and if that's where God is. Mm -hmm. Do we really think that God is in the cathedrals with that are trimmed in gold where they mm -hmm. come and go on Sundays and never see people or anything else? Mm -hmm. Or is God where the hungry are? Is God where the third is God in the hospital? And if that's where God is, then where should I be? I want to follow in the places where God is, wow. uh, where I understand God to be and do my work there and advocate for those people where I believe God is, is situated. Wow. And wow. I have another tangent question. I, I, again, cause I don't know, it, this, this is one of the things that um, uh, challenged me in, in my, in my own development. And I'm hoping this speaks to some people that are listening. So you talked about having this confidence to go where God is. You talked about having this Almost it this, again the courage and the confidence to engage with people whose beliefs might be different, and then I think we could pivot that or, or widen that a little bit for folks to maybe even have in depth, compassionate conversations to people whose lifestyles, whose lives might be in conflict with some of your own personal beliefs. And I, I want to ask you, like, where do you where do you find the confidence to explore the unexplored? Like how do you how do you get there? <laughs> Great well, question. That comes from your own relationship with the Most High God, mm -hmm. and when you have confidence in that relationship, and that it cannot be shaken, then I don't mind talking to other people. Mm -hmm. They not they not hurt my faith, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and ultimately they not gonna answer for me. Amen. Wow. And what I see from the scripture, when I understand the scripture and the and how God moves throughout the text, we know that God is a God of love and compassion and grace and mercy. Wow. Then let me be love and compassion and grace and Amen. mercy. And there Amen. are many things that are happening in today's society. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't even understand it well enough to know if I agree with it or not. I don't right. understand. I can't. I don't know new, new language. I don't know. I don't know. And the Lord said to me, daughter, I didn't call you to understand. I called you to love. Come on. Hey. Wow. Wow. And so what you need to do is love till you get to understand. Wow. Come on. You get to understand it. And you might not ever get to understand it. Yeah. All you got to do, your job, on earth is yes. to love is to love my people because they are all my people and let us not now this is me talking this is not what god said <laughs> it is we get hung up on what we define or call sin mm -hmm. um, as though we don't have sin in our own lives wow right 
the Bible says we have all sinned and fall short. So we want to talk about who's sleeping with who and whatnot, but we don't want to talk about the fact that we're gluttonous. Right, right. come on. We're not paying our tithes like we should, or we are unkind, or, 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 or. or. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, those are not sins that we put on a signpost inside the church that you, that, you know, you greedy in your food and you're eating, hello, and we're eating too much. <laughs> we're, not, we're not being good stu- stewards of the funds that God has given to us. Those are sins too. They are. Amen. We're looking at other people's husbands and wives. Those are sins too. But we don't, yeah. we don't, we don't push those to the front as something that we've got to, you know, issue with thus saith the Lord about. Mm-hmm. So we got to be, you know, <laughs> clear about our own selves yeah. and ask ourselves why we feel it necessary to call out some things, but not mm-hmm. all things. Right. That's right. right. Wow. wow. Uh, Bishop, I got to take us and, and kind of get, get, continue your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I want to, before you do that, I just want to recognize the people. First of all, I want I want the Bishop to know. Hey, um, Bishop, first of all, that's Felicia Johnson is a good friend of ours in Texas. Uh, she's working on her PhD uh, in, in, mm-hmm. in counseling psychology, I believe. Uh, you have uh, Cedric Dinkins in Texas, who's uh, a professor, a social professor of religion. And dean of the chapel uh, at um, Jarvis Jarvis Christian College. Uh, you have that's my sister who was there with us. I told you they'd be on oh, yeah. with heart. She's a speech pathologist in Birmingham, Alabama. And mm-hmm. then you have Thomas Douglas, who's professor of music at uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yes, and who who when he's he's the director of the Wichita Orchestra when he's doing the summer. In the theater months. Oh wow! And when he's here, he's he he worships at Saint Mark, mm-hmm. and I'm so blessed. So thank you guys for coming on. I just want to recognize and let the bishop know some of you all who are on. Thank mm-hmm. all of you are on. If you, but uh, quick quick announcement: if you know if you have a daughter, whatever age, make sure you get her on this conver- to this conversation because I promise you that. Uh, Bishop Daughtry has some powerful things to say to women about navigating corporate America, the workplace, uh, uh, academic institutions, and the church. Some powerful things. <laughs> okay, Kai, back to you, sir. Yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, I could I could probably stay right where we were, but I want to make sure that I I move the conversation um, forward. But just a, a, and I'd love to just take a quick moment to recap so people heard what she said. Uh, but she talked about again having this confidence to know where you are in Christ, right? And 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 I, the side point that I make is that when we understand who we are in Christ, or truly what it is that Christ did for us, you know, I I think it. It, it moves you beyond just wanting to be quote unquote sinless, but also gives you the courage to face your own sin down, to understand your own shortcoming. And when you can wrestle with your own short, your own sin, then you begin to see challenges in others, not as their downfall, but as their kindness to you. Right. And, it, it, and like you said, it, it just changes the way you relate to people. You don't have to be defensive when somebody has a different belief or a different faith. You can engage them honestly and wholly like Christ wants us to do. So thank you so much for that encouragement. I will just share this in my family. Um, you know, m- my father's children, we're all Christian and Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. My father's brother's children are Muslim and one is an imam. I've got folks who are evangelical, like deeper, deeper, true, holy, get your scuba scuba gear. We got Buddhists. So that's all in our one family, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. If my Holy Ghost cannot stand my Muslim cousins (laughs) praying to Allah in Arabic, I need to go check my Holy Ghost. That's right. That's not on there. Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. And I need oh. to go back to the altar. Yeah. Come on. Come Not on. Then. You know, it's that again, like these are these are it blows my mind sometimes the simplicity of the truth 
that would actually set us free versus what we think that we have to pray all day and all night and God give me this deep revelation. And true, what you just said is get the beam out your own eye. <laughs> That's what you just taught us, right? Um, so listen, you, you got- and, and that if if what you believe is real, and we and I know what I believe is real. I mean that you're not threatened by the faith and and even even the choices of other people. You you are free. What I have frees me to love those people. It doesn't put me in a cage. It doesn't make me run to a corner, mm -hmm. run, you know, uh, run and hide. It makes it like a, it frees me up to say, hey, I love you. Whether you ever believe what I believe, whether you ever change, whether you ever choose a lifestyle like a, like my call is to love you. I, I, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dinkins now, as a matter of fact, Dr. Dinkins says it, it quoting uh, Bishop love until you get the understanding and if the understanding never comes keep loving, keep loving. yes beautiful yes. bishop i believe i could hoop i believe i could close, I could close. <laughs> i'll uh i'll see if i can load up a shout track <laughs> relationship with god hard and it's not hard it's not hard it's, no come on it's not hard we we are the ones who add all these layers and rules and strictures, and it's not hard. God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Um, Simplify. Just love people. Just love the people. Just love the people. Even love when people. you can't stand them, love the people. <laughs> <laughs> so... So you mentioned you mentioned earlier, you were like, you know, there's just some things I don't know if I agree with it, you know, just stuff going on, some things I don't know. So what I do want to ask you is right now, what most concerns you about our nation and yes. our world? Yes, yes. I think, um, you know, in, on the 10,000 foot level, mm -hmm. I am concerned right now with the with the lack of love. The lack of grace, the lack of understanding that exists in our nation, the, the root of selfishness that abounds, that says, I'm not wearing a mask because mm -hmm. why should I? Uh, I had a driver tell me that the other day and I like because my father is 91 years old and my mother is 81 years old and I don't want them to get COVID. So I need you to put your mask on. Mm -hmm. um, but that that root which is demonic mm -hmm. in spiritual terms, where mm -hmm. we are so self-centered and self-engaged and self-motivated that mm -hmm. it leads to a lack of grace, a lack of mercy, a lack of love in our society. How does that manifest itself? It manifests itself through the way we've seen people act with COVID. It mm -hmm. manifests itself through our political institutions on what we are seeing in this January 6th uncovering, what we're seeing from the Supreme Court, which is basically saying six, six of them are conservative Catholics, that my religious beliefs mm -hmm. must be imposed on the nation. And mm -hmm. you must believe as I believe regardless of what your other belief system is. That root of selfishness Will, mm -hmm. is going to lead to our downfall. It mm -hmm. manifests itself as a lack of voting rights. Yes. We can't get voting rights passed. Now we have this issue with Roe v. Wade. And whatever you think about Roe v. Wade and abortion, and I referenced this in my Spellman speech, here's, here's, here's what I think. That decision is not about abortion. It's about mm -hmm. power. It's Ooh. about it's to decide. Mm -hmm. It's about who's in control. And for me, as the descendant of enslaved people who married who the slave master said they could marry, who had children when the slave master said they could have children, mm -hmm. who, couldn't, who couldn't marry on their own. That's why we jump in the broom today. Amen. Yep. We couldn't get married, so we jump in the broom. That's a holdover from the days of enslavement. And what we are seeing now is we're going back to 1850 when someone else was making decisions for you. This is for me less about abortion and I'm, it's less about me fighting for the right for people to have abortion than fighting for the right for people to control their lives. Wow. Amen. Anything wow. less. Wow. We are going back to 1850. Right. 
Right. Is that what we want as a nation? And I'm I'm a descendant. Of, I'm not going back to that. I'm not going back to before Lincoln's freed the slaves. <laughs> right. Somebody exciting for me. Right. Yes. Evidence of enslavement. Someone deciding for you, and that is the path that they have us on. Absolutely. You know, um, I love the way that you uh, <laughs> that you really parse that out, and I like my heart is turning flips because <laughs> that I've I've had conversations with people, and 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 exactly what you said. I've talked about this selfishness, right, and and how it manifests itself, even even. Even uh, one other lane I'd add to that is, you know, of course, we know capitalism, but like a lot of what's happening with these large investment companies that are buying up all this residential housing, essentially locking folks out of home ownership, the number one pathway to building wealth. Right. Uh, when we talk about the fact that we can't uh, that we can't get wages up for people. Right. Because people at the top that don't want to give money up or corporations that don't want to give money up. All of this behavior, I agree with you so much. The, the root of this drives all the way back to selfishness. Um, and it's like you said, I think really the need for public theologians is, is so dire. And um, I'm wondering if maybe you could, I don't know, just speak a word of encouragement to those people of faith about how do we, uh, maybe just to inspire them to, to not hide, I don't know, not to say not hide their faith at work, but but find out how to let it show up because I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner. And I've been telling companies, I said, I think you need to get pastors and people that are phasing out of ministry to actually come in and do your diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Because as a corporation, you have no ethical, you have no real moral foundation. I, most of my work is discerning people's faith traditions then helping them build out a paradigm by which they decide how they're going to treat people for long lasting change. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know from your, from your standpoint, what inspiration or what encouragement would you give believers of every sort and type to find the courage to engage their, their convictions in such a way that we can drive more impact. Does that make sense? It's a great question. And before she answers, let me give a shout out to any, of our to our Kifa community, we may have some folks from oh, Kansas yeah. Interfaith Action who are watching tonight, uh, which is a, a faith-based uh, advocacy organization. We bring together people across all uh, various faith faith traditions to advocate for justice issues in the state of Kansas. Uh, I believe we're broadcasting on the Kifa page. So to all of our Kifa folks, hello! Thank you for watching. Uh, give, give us a shout out. Make give give some comments so that I can know you there. But that's a perfect question. Uh, but uh, to before to as I recognize my key for folks, Dr. Mm -hmm. you know, I think one, I want us as the people of God to divorce ourselves from the things that we learned about what it means to be a Christian, yeah, mm -hmm. and what it means to show up as a Christian. Because we were taught that, you know, the holier on, you were, the longer your skirt was, the bigger the Bible was. You had to quote <laughs> the scriptures. You had to know them by heart with the citations. You know, carry the tambourine under your arm. All of that was how to be a Christian. Yes. I want to challenge our people to say, is that really what God is looking for? And is that really what God is calling wow. Wow. You is that the demonstration of Christianity that God is calling? Jesus didn't walk around with a I'm a Christian t-shirt on. Uh -huh. Right? <laughs> what is the mark? The mark is that we love one another, Boy. that we and that we take our belief systems mm -hmm. into the workplace, into the shopping mall, into the hospital, into the places we go. What is it? They shall know that you are Christians by your love. Come on. So how are how is that love showing up when you go to work? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's as simple as you got a smile on your face in the morning, that you are willing to listen to folks, that you are helpful, that the attitude stays at home, that the that the you, I'm not saying get walked over because that's not Jesus either, because he did turn over some tables in the, in the temple. <laughs> <laughs> to, me, to, to, to wherever you are. The best model that you are Christian, the best testimony is that you are walking in the example of our God, demonstrating mm -hmm. love and grace and mercy 
and peace and being the magnet that people said there's something different. In the midst of all this confusion, there's love. In the midst of all this confusion, he's bringing joy, grace, mercy. That is the replica of God that I think we're called to be. And it's hard. Yes. Say it again. <laughs> Especially these days, it can be very discouraging with everything that's happening in the nation. But I'll tell you this. In the end, the God promises us, if you read to the end of the book, <laughs> God promises us that in the end, it will be all right. So if it's not all right, then it's not the end. Wow. We got more to do. We got ways to yes. go. Yes. Wow. That's yes. that's that's good. That's good. Now, if we were to if we were to laser beam that in a little bit more, and I if I were to ask you, then what uh what's your counsel to pastors and church leaders for how to engage with the challenges of our times? Yes. Um, well, I think one and start with get smarter about the issues. Come on, hey. Read. Read. And read more than one source. We watch more than one set of news. I can't stand Fox, but I watch them every once in a while just so I can hear yeah. what the enemy is saying, right? And I get my apologetics straight. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but we got to be smart. We got to be as smart as the enemy yeah. in order to battle the enemy. So, read a book, yeah. read some newspapers, watch some uh, alternate TV. You know, read something besides the Bible. Find a conversation partner where you can dive into the issues. Because if you are a pastor, you have a responsibility for all the sheep following behind you. And we all know that sheep are not the brightest animals. They follow where the shepherd leads them. And if the shepherd leads them off a cliff, they will follow each other right off the cliff. You have a responsibility as a pastor at, to look over the horizon to see what's coming and to lead the sheep to a place where they will be safe. You can't do that being unlearned. Wow. Wow. You got to read, you got to study, you got to break down issues. Let me give you a perfect example. The Supreme Court this week ruled that the general, the, the coach could pray with his players on 50 yard line at the end of games. I saw Christians all over rejoicing that there was prayer. Mm -hmm. Dig a little deeper. You have a man in authority asking people underneath him to adhere to his faith tradition. That's that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. As long as he's Christian. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. The first time the coach is is of another faith, and I'm not talking about the big three. There's Satanists. There's people who practice witchcraft, and they decide they're taking your children to the 50 yard line to cast some spells. You're going to have a heart attack. Exactly. Prayer. The, those sorts of religious beliefs do not belong in public settings like that. My father used to say, "Pray at home," because if I left prayer to the schools, it's too late. It's too late because I'm. We prayed every morning before we left the house. Wow. So that's an unpacking issue mm -hmm. that you have to think more deeply than just, oh, they praying in schools. I don't want them to pray in schools. No, 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 no. I don't know who's praying. I don't that's know right. that I don't know what that's that teacher's belief system is. And then my child come home crazy talking foolishness. And then I'm gonna say, where'd they get that from? Right. Right. Teach, teach reading math and arithmetic. Right. right. So, but that's an example of what I mean by digging deeper, mm -hmm. pulling it back, thinking critically about these decisions. And why would a Supreme Court who won't protect your voting rights, who won't protect your Miranda rights, who won't protect your privacy rights, all of a sudden get it right on prayer in school? Unpack it, dig deeper. Ask more questions. If you're not sure, get some, ask somebody. Find a theologian. Find someone who has a different opinion from yours and ask them. What do you think about this? In order to get your apologetics straight so you can argue mm -hmm. it. Right. You need to in the deeper issues. And that's key to being a shepherd. Nobody becomes a shepherd and doesn't know where the water is. Nobody mm -hmm. becomes a shepherd and doesn't know where the green grass is. God appoints people as shepherds because they have the wisdom to lead people into mm -hmm. a clear path besides still waters where they can cool. rest their 
kids' souls. That's your responsibility. You have a responsibility, a command. Wow. To find the place where to, to be the leader that God has appointed you to be. Wow. That is um again super, super impactful. Uh um, uh, before I make my comment, shout out to Frank Vasquez. Uh, that is one of my classmates here at APTS. Thanks for joining, Frank. Love you, man. Uh, but it, you, I mean, you look, I mean, you, you laid this out so beautifully, but again, you know, I'm, I'm late thirties, haha. And, uh, but my, my upbringing, right. All I really knew pastoring to be was preaching. Right now, if I can, if I can go in here and break out that three point sermon, Dinkins, where yet, where yet, Dinkins, if I can break out that three point sermon, right, and and I can give me a cliche or a, or a nice little catchphrase and a hoop, then I've done my job, right. And if the offering was good, let me just keep it real from what they were. <laughs> It, then I've done my job, but I love this light that you're shining. And Dinkins was all with us, and he made the same point. Listen, pastors, preachers, leaders, watch this, Christians, there are more books than the Bible. And I'm not, not discrediting the word. We need to engage with it. But, but, but the bishop has said it so plainly. There is so much additional knowledge and wisdom and strategy and different things that we can understand that we can read with our God-given talents and skills and turn around and help inspire and implement in the world. And if we're talking about the kind of change that we're talking with, that we want to have, just like the word encourage us to move beyond the milk and get to the meat, you, you do that in the word and you do that in life. If you want to move forward, if we want to be that, we want to be a progressing people of God, then it's going to require that we engage ourselves in the activities to give us wisdom, knowledge, and faith. Okay. So thank you so much for that. I'm just, I'm, I'm over here encouraged. I'm really ready to go out here and just start talking to folks that I'm ready. I'm ready to go do the work. That's what I want to go to. I, I want to jump I, and, I, and I want to jump in here. Just yeah. such great questions. Kai. I want to jump in and just ask a quick question of a doctor. Daughtry. So what do you, is it, is it possible? Uh, I don't know if you know of Andy, Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley has a book out, a new book out called uh, Not In It to Win It. And basically he talks about, he went through an ordeal at his church where he, they, he, they wanted people, told people to wear a mask. And he had droves of people, you know, he's in Atlanta, Georgia. He had droves of people leaving his church and said that they said that he wouldn't take a side. And he says, I am taking a side. I'm taking the side of people. I'm taking the side of the kingdom. But he talked about that entire orde ordeal. And so basically the rest of the book is talking about how we engage the issues of our day, but stay root deeply rooted in our in our faith tradition and that we speak out of that. Because if we and I think he's right. I want to get your feet. That if we use the language of, and the Pope said the same thing. The Pope says in a recent statement, we must not use the language of politics, but the language of, of faith and the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wrestling with that idea. And I think there's some truth to it because so many words, so much of the language we've we use, yeah. Bishop, has been so politicized that it's hard to break through once you begin to use that language. Any thoughts on that? You know, I think... Um... As Christians, we have to be multilingual. And so there are, wow. there's a wow. way that we talk in church. Wow. Church folk. There's a way that we talk on our jobs. We don't go in our jobs with, you know, praise the Lord saints, right? Well, that's right. We have to be able to talk uh, and to speak in multiple languages, depending on the situation. Wow. Right. Right, and we have to be facile with that. Yes. So let me let let me see where I am and who is my audience, right. and then let me craft. Listen, you're not gonna you're not for those of us who preach. You don't do a seeker sermon to a bunch of people who've been saved for fifty years. That's right. They don't right. Need That's not what they want. Right. <laughs> and they were all sit there going, right. oh, bless him, Lord. Right. <laughs> And we're not going to speak, do, you know, teach the book of Revelations to people who got saved last week. That's, 
that's language. So that's right. us deciding how and where to exercise. And that requires some wisdom. So I think we often, it goes back to my other point, we often as Christians have a narrow way of defining how we look, act, and move in the world. And I advocate that we think more broadly about what God is requiring of us in this moment, in these times. You know, I and I have to say, I've got to say this. So one of my favorite preachers, uh, Dr. Dinkins, I don't know if he's still on, uh, one of the people that I really like, uh, modeled my preaching after, and, and and that's and please, as I say that, be, you know, the, the, because if he if he knew this, he'd probably be like, don't ever tell anybody that again. <laughs> but uh, Dr. James Forbes was a was an inspiration to me. He was on one of the people that I I studied his. I thought, but but he was a Pentecostal who was intellectual acad academician mm -hmm. with a social consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the way he integrated those things. And I got to just say this to you. you. You mentioned your Pentecostal background. There is nothing like what happens when a Pentecostal blends that Pentecostal fervor with, with academic excellence mm -hmm. and with social consciousness. There is nothing like it. I just got to say that to you. <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts? As a matter of fact, what are your thoughts on that? And then tell us a little about it. You talked about your dad. Six, fifth, sixth generation preacher. Tell us a little about your story, a little background on your story. It's interesting you ask that in the context of Dr. Forbes, because when my father first uh, went into ministry, one of his biggest encouragers was Dr. Forbes' father. Wow. Yeah. And he, because my father, you know, he was young and fiery and he was really uh, doing a lot with liberation theology. Uh, mm -hmm. We were first churches in New York to have a black Messiah in, in our in our church. Um, we had wow. it painted, um, <laughs> commissioned. And so Dr. Forbes is senior, the father said, heard my father preach and said, you got, you got something there. You should write that up. I will publish it for you. Wow. Uh, and so our families have been knit together since that time. And I actually worked for uh, Dr. Forbes's brother-in-law, Congressman Ed Towns, was my first job in oh, Washington. Nice. And uh, he, Congressman Towns married Jim Forbes' sister. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. that, that's an interesting, uh, it's interesting that you bring that up. But we were raised in that kind of church where we tried to understand where God was walking. Wow. And try to understand what God was saying about police abuse of power and homelessness and the lack of medical care. And I could because we could not accept that God didn't care that I couldn't get medical care. Yeah. That our God only cared about what happened in the four walls of our church. We wow. if God is God, then God cares about every fiber of his mm -hmm. people being that includes whether or not you can go to the doctor. Amen. Whether or not you have some place to live. Whether right. or not there is fresh food. How do you take care of the temple of God when there is no grocery store in 10 miles? Mm -hmm. God cannot be pleased with that. And with mm -hmm. the systems that Come create on. those kinds of inequities. That is what Jesus was talking about when he turned the temple, turned the tables over. He yes. wasn't talking about dinners and, and who's selling popcorn in the church. He was talking about a system that was defrauding. Amen. People. And so he sought to challenge that. That's the church I grew up in. <laughs> and so inside of that, our thing was, you know, we believe that God is the God of the oppressed. Who's oppressed in this place, Black people? Mm -hmm. So how do we then create coalitions with others to move the community forward? And so, you know, you come to our church on, on, on any given Friday, and there was a community meeting of Muslims and Black Panthers and communists and socialists and capitalists and the polygamists and the, this one and then that one. We were the only Christians. Yeah. They met in our church <laughs> where we strategized about what was going to happen and what we could do next. And when the meeting, was, and then we go downtown for a rally. And when the rally was over, they come back to the church. There'd be food and there'd be a prayer meeting. And those who wanted to pray, 
<laughs> and so some of the ranking radicals of the day were in our sanctuary for prayer service. <laughs> having gone to the rally and having done the strategizing about how to move black people forward and how to protect black people. So what was the thing that was the most Christian in that? Was it the prayer service? Hmm. Was it the organizing meeting where we made space for people? Oh, wow. Wow. Rally. Wow. Follow us from the rally to the church. Wow. Where was God? In all, and I say I would say the most holy thing, the most Christian thing, was mm. not the prayer service. Yeah. yeah. It was the thing that got people to the prayer service. <laughs> Come on. Yes. 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 As yes. usual, I'm trying to. I'm trying to find my words, y'all, but like my heart is, uh, my heart is really just uh, rejoicing because as you're speaking, man, as you're speaking, like all, 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 all of what's resounding in my heart is this is the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. And I'm, I'm getting emotional and moved to a point because uh, I, <laughs> things are constantly happening in our world to rob us of hope. And as a sister put it, 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 it robs us a space to be ourselves. It robs us, robs us. Woo, it robs us of the gift of community. Yeah. And man, if the church cannot be anything else but a place where we find community, where we find a place where my brokenness is on it, where we find a place that something bigger than me needs my help, a place a place and a body where we belong, man. When you work with people in and out and you see so many people, that all they want at the end of the day is for somebody to see them and to love them and to know them and to think that we, we struggle to do that in the house of God. It, man, it renders my heart so much. And we do it because they're because they're Muslim, we do it because well, they're 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 part of this community. They're they're same gender loving, or, or or we do it because of somebody's race. We do it because of somebody's socioeconomic status, man. And I just think, and then we have the audacity to think that because we set a law setting abortions illegal, that all of a sudden God is going to smile on us, <laughs> and the world is going to be okay because we decided to slam the door shut on opportunity for folks. When Jesus came and gave his life to kick the door to opportunity wide open. And so when I hear you talk about that experience, when I hear you talk about that, my heart longs because I go, what is my generation going to do? Yeah. Are we going to be those folks? Are we going to be the ones to tell the story that we stood arm in arm the time when we created space? And y'all hear me and hear me well. We think that we're going to take people to church and change their life. But I love what she said. Sometimes the best way to change a person's life is just creating space for them to be. <laughs> creating the opportunity for God to show up. Creating the opportunity for people to do life together. That was brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, and just you have to, and we have to ask ourselves and, 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 and root ourselves in the word of God. What does God do? <laughs> God makes space Amen. for everybody. Jesus, look at who Jesus counted among the twelve. Yeah. There, it was not who who it, mm -hmm. it, our, devi our own devices. We wouldn't probably pick none of them. Right. 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 But Jesus made space for those whom society had discarded and overlooked. Why do we do something different? Something mm -hmm. totally different. Something totally. Mm -hmm. it, it's and almost like. We're not, if we want to get back to where God is and who and, and our namesake of being Christians, then we have to do what Christians, what Christ did. <laughs> Amen. Which was make space for everybody, help yeah. everyone to feel welcome at his table. 100%. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. And it's, and it's so interesting. Bishop and Kai, we almost met churches almost measure themselves by their ability to exclude people. Like the, the more we exclude people, the holier we are. 
the more mm. we exclude people, the more clo the closer to God we are, the closer to Jesus we are. When Jesus did the exact opposite, he mm. measured by the capacity to include people and to love people beyond your understanding, yes. especially loving the stranger. So, uh, Bishop, I, I, I exegete the word stranger for our times to mean anybody who's different from you. So yes. Jesus talk, the Bible says it talks constantly about the stranger for the stranger, anybody who's different from you. Like we, it doesn't, it doesn't cost me. It doesn't challenge me to love Kai and Bishop Leah. We, mm -hmm. we, we talk the same language. We love the same Jesus. We have, we ha have the same values. That that's not a test of my faith. My faith mm -hmm. is tested when I love people who are different. And when I love beyond my understanding, such great stuff. Uh, I, Kai, I, it's 804. I, yeah, yeah. I gotta pull her into this. Yes. And then we're gonna put her on solo screen. Yeah. She's like, what? <laughs> say, say that amazing message you preached at the baccalaureate service. Would you just like kind of give some highlights from that? But then speak to all, I, I wanna speak to all my sisters who are listening, from my mom who's in the ministry to leaders in the local church. Some of the folks right here in St. Mark, who both are leaders in our church, but leaders in our in the community. Would you say a word to women about? I believe you could. The title of that message that day was "Make Room, for, Make Space for Yourselves." What was it? Take up space. Take up space. Yes, yes, that's even better. So just, just bless us. We're gonna, we're gonna put you on solo screen and just let you talk. And encourage, encourage our sisters out there. Well, I will uh, I will spare you the whole exegesis of the text, but I will share with you for the preachers on the call that my text was about the daughters of Zelophehad and how they had to advocate for themselves because they were left out of the lineage of inheritance according to the rules that existed at that time. But they appealed to Moses at the tent of meeting and made an impassioned plea for why they should be included, why they needed the space that they were asking, which was the land that Joshua at that point, that Moses and then Joshua was apportioning. And my question to the audience at Spelman that I ask you today is, how are you taking up space? What is the space that you require? See, Zelophehad's daughters understood that the dreams that they had for their lives, the, the dreams that they had for their family, the hope, the aspirations that they had thought about themselves, the five sisters as they sat underneath the tent and talked about the things that women talk about when they're underneath the tent. They realized that the rules as they existed did not give them the space that they needed to live out into their dreams. And so they needed something different. And so they went to Moses and they said, you got to do something different because these rules are not fair. These rules don't apply to me. These rules don't give me what I need to be all that I think God is calling me to be. They pressed their case and the rules were changed and the land was given. The rules of inheritance were changed and the land was given to the daughters of Zelophehad. So what I'm asking that day, and I ask you, how are you taking up space? How are you making room for yourself, for your dreams, for your aspiration, for your inspiration. Do you have what you need to breathe? Do you have what you need to live? Do you have what you need to expand your tent? Do you have what you need to aspire to all the things that you thought about in your secret place and sister, brother, how are you taking up space? How are you taking up space? And taking up space is not just a matter of declaring it. It's a matter of doing something to take up space. The daughters of the Zelophehad went to Moses and said, we need a rule change. What rule change do you need Wow! in order for you to take up space? What is the action that you're going to do? Because you see, the powers that be are not interested in your space. <laughs> Powers that be are happy with the space that they occupy, which necessarily infringes on your space. So changing the dynamic means that you're going to have to take some affirmative action in your house, on your job, with your spouse, in your church to say, I need more room. Wow. Yes. I need more space to be who God designed me to be before the foundation of time. This little box you get put me in is not what God intended for me. Sister, how are you taking up space? 
Have you decided that you need more space? Some of us live between beneath our privilege because we don't even think we deserve more than what we had. But our God, the creator of the universe, says that the space that you are in, whatever space you're in, is not big enough for what God has designed for you. Beloved, I will do exceeding abundantly above all you're able to ask or even think, what are you doing to take up space? Wow. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Yes. And I just pray for all, I have two daughters and <clears throat> that's why that message just speaks to me because I've tried to raise them to be bold I've tried to raise them to be, to just, to, to, to dream big, to, to be curious, Kai, uh, to cultivate holy curious, what Kai calls holy curiosity, creative imagination. And so I just said, I pray that my sisters hear, hear that. So this is on, this is on YouTube. You folks, y'all can go back and watch this over and over again, because she says so much in such a brief amount of time. Go read the story of Zalofa Had's daughters. Go read that story. So you'll know the story from the biblical context and then go back and listen to that. You, you can replay this, share it with others, let them see it. And we just pray for you that you'll be, be encouraged. I know uh, that I, I am even even as someone who's tried to empower women um, and who have been who have who watched women be empowered. I, I got to say this about my dad, Kai. One of the things that I loved about my dad when we were growing up as kids, there were five kids. That, that my dad always put my mom on the pedestal and treated her like a queen. Like everything had to revolve around my mom. If my mom was asleep, everybody, nobody could talk. If mom was cooking, leave her alone. If mom was cooking, she shouldn't be cooking. Get like, get up, get off the couch, turn the TV off, do the work. He, he, everything revolved around. And so I saw that I've tried to be that kind of guy. I've tried to raise my daughters to expect that. <laughs> But even still, Dr. Uh, uh, Bishop Lee, I find myself in so many ways, and my staff even challenged me on this ways that I'm that I just have these blinders on and don't see the struggles and the pitfalls that the women around me have to deal with on a daily basis. So it's that is an excellent point, and I commend you. I think fathers with I'm a daddy's girl, so you know, I, fathers with daughters have a special responsibility. But I want to say to you. The Spellman speech was probably part one. So if I were writing part two, I would focus on Moses. Wow. And I would, because he made space for, for them. And I would say to the brothers, to the father, how are you making space? Mm -hmm. Who are you making space for? Because if Mo Moses could have just stopped them and said, I'm not talking to y'all. Because women, you know, weren't allowed at the tent of meeting. But uh -huh. Moses made space for them to press their case. And so I want to ask all of us, not just the fathers with daughters, but who are you making space for? Amen. Who are you opening doors for? Who are you scooching over to make room at the table for? Mm -hmm. All of us have a responsibility to bring somebody with Amen. us. Amen. And if you're not bringing someone, if you don't have a young mentee, you mm -hmm. don't have a mentee, period. Okay, let's talk. You need to be, have somebody that you are bringing with you. Reverend Jackson used to call it on his campaign, we have responsibility to swing somebody through. Yeah, yeah. So when he was running for president, he didn't go to means by himself. He didn't go nowhere by himself. There was 50 of us. Yeah. Traveling <laughs> back. None of us knew anything about running for president, but we were going to learn. He was going to see to it that we understood. That's how I started. Wow, wow. Yeah. Wow. And the campaign objective going to means we didn't know we did not know what we were doing. No yeah. idea. We didn't know anything about a convention right. and credentials and what happens in these spaces, what's supposed to happen. At, we had no idea. We learned. He he said, You gotta swing somebody through. We in here now. Swing somebody <laughs> through. And what 20 years later, I was CEO of the convention. Wow. Because of the moment of him swinging me through to learn and to see and just stand on the wall, getting the coffee. Young people don't want to get coffee for nobody no more. I got. I learned a lot getting coffee and carrying pocketbooks mm -hmm. and making copies. And I stand on the wall. I had no seat at the table because we wasn't allowed. Mm. 
But I walked in with Rem Willie Barrow. I walked in with Rem and Jesse Jackson. I walked in with Dorothy Height, Alexis Herman, and listened and learned, and they swung me through. So when I had an opportunity to be the chief of staff of the Democratic Party, I had been there before because I'd been in the room with Alexis Herman. Wow. Wow. Somebody throwing me through. So my question: Who are you making space for? Who are you mm -hmm. taking with you? Don't go to no means by yourself. Take somebody. Take a Amen. young person. Amen. Let them see. Let them learn. Let Amen. Them sit they might not have no role, but let them sit up there. Let just to see a different vision of what's possible. That's our responsibility. That's what the disciple. That's what Jesus that, called disciples for. That's where she got to it. There it is. <laughs> that need the disciples. He. Look, Jesus came to God, so he was going to the cross with, with Judas or without Judas. He was going to, if he had to nail himself <laughs> to the cross. But he chose those folks. Yes, he, yes, yes. To yes. surround himself with people who didn't know nothing about no Jesus and no God. They ain't know nothing about, they were tax collectors and fishermen. <laughs> fishermen. They didn't know. He brought them in. Amen. So that when he was not physically present, they were able to carry forward the lessons. Amen. Who are your disciples? Who are you bringing with you? Who are you making space for? Who's Amen. on your short list? Who do you call when you go to meetings? Who are you taking with you? Amen. Amen. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm ready to sprint in about 20 other directions as well. Um, I know, I know your mind is turning. Every <laughs> sentence, every sentence is just so pregnant. Right. Kai, Kai, you know we we owe it to the preachers. We owe it to yeah. the preachers. We owe it to to Dr. Dinkins, who was our guest last week. Uh huh. Dr. Bishop, you've got to just take just a moment and and talk to the preachers about your pro, your approach to exegesis towards the preaching task. Just just a quick piece. <laughs> You know, I, I you mean the practical stuff? Yes. I, you know, I try to listen for God and see where God is walking and and be sensitive to the move of the spirit. And um, and in my prayer time, in my reading time, I mean, I read a lot of different stuff. I may hear just a thread. Y'all know, we hear, we hear a thread. So mm -hmm. now after I get the thread, now I got, I'm sitting here in my office. I got all the you know, books. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, you know, we come we come out with a bunch of books. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened in the world? Yeah. For me and my ministry, and where I think God has called me, can I just get a text and preach straight from the text and just talk about Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost? Of course I can. But I contend where God has called me is to say, people, when they come to hear a word from the Lord, they come to hear a word that's relevant Amen. to their lives and to their situations. So if I had been preaching Sunday, they was going to hear text about this. They was going to hear about the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yep. What justice means. Mm -hmm. Because I think, especially for our people, coming into the coming into Sunday after the, a tumultuous week like this, and we say nothing. No, come on. We stand behind the holy desk to deliver a word from the Lord. And if we say nothing about the current situation, whatever the week is, then we are saying that God has nothing to say. Wow. Mm. Mm. That's, that, wow. God has nothing to say about June, about Juneteenth and the fact that some people didn't know they was free till somebody came to them two years ago. Really? Mm. I don't care. God didn't care about that. We just going to mm. act like that didn't happen. We just go act like the children didn't get killed in Uvalde, that mm -hmm. that the church folk didn't get killed in Buffalo. We just go act like that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Do we think that's what God would do? Mm -hmm. Do we think that if Jesus was in our church, that Jesus would have nothing to say about Buffalo and would right. just preach the, the Lord is my shepherd text? I don't <laughs> think so. So yeah. my task is to weave together what is present and try to hear what God, the word that God wants to offer to the people that Sunday. And sometimes that means, in this particular weekend, that the sermon changes on Saturday night. Come on, yes. Yes. I yes. know we got a series, but you know. 
The, <laughs> you gotta push it up. You gotta come on. You can be relevant to people's lives Ooh. and raise relevant people. Otherwise, you have sheep who are blind and sheep who never grow because they're not challenged to think about anything but the sixty-six books. Yep. And not challenged to think about how the 66 books are relevant to their current situation, which is in essence telling them that God is not relevant to their current situation. Mm. Wow. The library is full. Poetry, the- music, concordances, 10, 12, 15 Bibles in all different versions. Because, you know, I even got a Gullah Bible because I'm Gullah. <laughs> Come on, now. <laughs> the gospel is right. Because you know you gotta you gotta be ready. Be, you gotta be ready and your message needs to be rich because you you're not speaking for yourself, you're speaking for God. Hey, uh, okay now I almost turned the table over. You huh? You shaking up my system over here. <laughs> but that's for God as a preacher of standing behind the holy desk on Sunday, you are speaking for God. You are God's representative. What you going to say? Amen. 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 You just Amen. run around the church? Come on now. What would God be saying? Again and again, where I started. Where's God walking? Where's he walking? Where's God walking? Where's God walking? Kai, before you, just so powerful. I want to make sure I get this in, that mm-hmm. I share this. Uh, so, and then we'll turn to the closing question, see if uh, Bishop has any closing remarks, but I want to I- invite you all. She did not ask us to do this, but I w- we, I'm going we, I'm going to send something. I want to give you all an opportunity to do as well, to send Bishop Daughtry a gift just as a thank you for how she has blessed us. And that's her cash app, dollar sign LD Daughtry. If you miss it, you can, or you want to do it later, dollar sign dollar sign LD Daughtry. Uh, that's our cash app handle. So let's send her something bless her just to express. I think anytime somebody pours into us, we should pour into them back. And that's in every sphere. Uh, that's if somebody makes space for me in, in, in ecclesiastical circles, I want to make space for somebody else. And then I want to see how I can pour back into them. By the way, our guest next week is uh, Stephen Thurston. Uh, many of you all knew his dad. This is a son amazing preacher, creative thinker. I can't wait to see the fireworks between Kai and Steven, two of these two young men in their late thirties, brilliant, creative. Uh, but he talks about, he does, we, we were talking today, he talked about how he loves to be generous. And so uh, that's just a way of giving back when people are poured into you. So I want to encourage you all to do that. Kai, you want to do the final question. And then Bishop, we're going to ask you uh, after this final question and answer, to close us with, to pray for us. I would love for you just to pray for us. Okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Quick shout out, if you all did not catch it too, uh, she has a award-winning book out for yes. colored girls who have considered politics. I'm an avid reader. I hope this is, I'm gonna check to see if, if I can do this on my Audible, because if so, I do my books when I'm working out. Absolutely. So I I can't wait to read it and be empowered to pass that truth and wisdom on to others that I encounter. Um, I guess uh, the last question you're talking about here, Robert, is it the um, words of encouragement or? I don't know if you just had if you had another final question that you wanted to throw in. If not, you can just. Yeah, I think I think um, I think I'm good because, you know, we'll be chasing a rabbit. So. I just want to, I'll kick it over to you or Dr. Leah to see if there's just any closing thoughts, you announcements that she, uh, she wants to leave us with before we wrap up and then a prayer and prayer for the people. Well, I would like for her just to, to give us all some encouragement. You know, this is an election year and there's so mm-hmm. much going on. Uh, I, I've got, I got to tell you, Bishop, I wanted to, I was looking forward to hearing you because I struggle. I, I am struggling daily since like every day something's happening. And as as horrible stuff is happening, people are becoming more aware, are more caring. They're becoming more selfish is what you talked about. It's like everybody, like something horrible happens. And instead of us pulling together and building community and helping each other, people run deeper into their corners mm-hmm. and act like they don't care. I mean, I saw a, a news story the other day uh, that Russia dropped a bomb on a shopping center where there were a thousand people. Now, thanks be to God. I mean, you know, 
and I and listen to this language. Only fifty, only sixty people died. Like listen to that. Only sixty people died, but they mm -hmm. drop. They've dropped bombs on daycare centers. They dropped on. They've dropped bombs on, and and the world goes on. And so I I struggle with that despair. And the only thing that way that I is people like Kai, uh, Bishop Daughtry, the people of Saint Mark, the people of Kifa, I give. That's where I find my hope. My family. That's why I find my hope. But would you speak some words of hope? Give us some counsel as we go deep into this election cycle as a public theologian, as a public pastor, and then pray for us. Absolutely. Well, again, I want to thank you for this opportunity and for this to have such a rich conversation with you both. It has been a joy for me. Uh, to be here. I want, by way of announcement, I want to share with you that I recently launched a podcast. It's called The Faithful Citizen. Okay. It explores, it, it explores the issues of the day through the lens of faith. You can find it on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, uh, The Faithful Citizen. It's, I think I just posted the second episode and we're talking in that one about reparations. So, but it's all through the lens of faith. So I want to encourage you to um, to sign up for the podcast on Apple, on Spotify, on YouTube, all of that. There's also a website and we're on Instagram and all the things the young people told me I had to be on in order to. <laughs> so there you, there you have it. We are at a critical uh, uh, point in our nation. And really the question is for the church and for the people of God, where will we be? It is a race now, I think, between hope and fear. And what where will what what wins? Hope or fear? Wow. And because we are the people of God, we stand on the side of hope. And every time I think about getting discouraged or not quite sure what to do. Um, I think about that scripture, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in chariots, handmade and man-made things. Some trust in horses, the, 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 the natural order of things. But my hope is built because I trust in the name of the Lord. My hope is built on something that others can't see, can't quantify. My hope is not in this world, but it's in what the world that is to come and the promises that have been made to me in the text. Now that doesn't mean I abandon the world. That means I strive every day to help the world come to an understanding of God and the principles of Jesus Christ. That's my calling. That's what I believe the calling of all of us as Christians are. So what does that mean? We have a responsibility in this nation to give Caesar that which is Caesar and to give God that which is God. What do we owe Caesar? We owe Caesar faithful responsibility, faithful citizenship in this country. That means go vote. I'm not telling you who to vote for. If you want me to tell you who to vote for, call me later. <laughs> We have to, if the people of God don't have an opinion wow. about the direction of this nation, then who will? If we're not going to stand and stake a claim about the direction of this nation through the, through the people we elect to public office to represent, then who's, who, who's going to stand? Who's going to stand? We have a we have a responsibility to be a faithful witness. So look, register to vote in my church, in my denomination. Part of the membership requirement is that you're registered to vote. Wow. We're not going to tell you who to vote for, but we want you to be a faithful citizen. And Amen. that means being a particular. So when electeds come to our church, they know they're talking to they know they're talking to a, a, a church full of uh, registered voters. <laughs> it's different. Yeah. We have to stand for that. We have to participate. We have to bring kingdom values to the voting booth and exercise that franchise. And then when you get discouraged, remember who your hope is in, where your faith lies. Because this world, as the old folks say, is not always. So I'm not judging success based on what I can see. Because ultimately, God is on the throne. What I'm judging success and where I'm keeping my eye is on God. And where is God walking? Amen. Wow. Yes. Amen. 
So let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we are grateful to you for this day, a day you've made unlike any that we've seen before. God, as we stand at this point in history that you blessed us to be in this point in history where there is so much good happening, but also so much bad happening. Help us to remember that you are still God. And that in the end, you always have the victory. Help us to understand that the challenges that we are seeing today are simply the last gasp of an enemy that knows it is destined to die. God, help us to put our shoulder to the wheel. Help yeah. us to be good stewards of our time and our money and our resources. Help us to be good stewards of our people. Help those of us who are shepherds to lead with integrity to lead with wisdom, to lead with knowledge, keeping you as their North Star. And for those of us who are called to follow, Lord, help us follow with faithfulness, follow with dignity, follow with integrity to fulfill the task of fellowship that you have left to us. Lord, we are grateful for what you are doing, yes. for what you have done, yes. and for what we yet expect you to do. We live in expectation that every day, just around the corner, you're going to perform a miracle. Just around the corner, you're going to make your presence known. Just yes. around the corner, the blessing is coming. Just around the corner, the answer is coming. We trust you. We believe you, God. We've staked our faith on you being who you said you are. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you the glory. We trust you to take us to the next level, to the next place. We trust you to help us to be more Christ-like every single day. We trust you. We believe you. And we count it done. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hey Amen. I am. Uh, I'm, thank you so much for sharing your gifts, your talent, your wisdom with us. Uh, I've been inspired, encouraged, um, and truly in this moment renewed. Um, I'm so grateful and so hopeful for what God is doing in you uh, and what you're speaking, and encouraging us to be receptive for him to do on us. You have really blessed us today. And I know that sounds like super churchy talk to some folks, but I, I really, I, I mean that my, my, my bishop, my, my reverend, my, my sister, my friend, thank you so much for this evening. Truly. Thank you. Blessing. Good night, mom. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Good night, people. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. As a matter of fact, I'll put it up real quick. Uh, and, and next week, I'm just I'm just like we did tonight. I'm, I'm going to kind of just move out of the way. Well, I thought I had it ready. I'm going to move out of the way and just let Kai and, uh, and, and Stephen Thurston interact and just feed off of that. Bishop, I got to tell you, oh, my God, just a, such a powerful prayer that the miracle, the blessing, the change is right around the corner. But when you said, like the old folks used to say, this world ain't always. Oh, I remember that. That's a statement of hope. Uh, it, 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 however, I, I don't know if that's grammatically structured right, but they, they were right on it. They were so grounded in hope. This world ain't always. Thanks be to God for that. We thank you all for watching. Bishop, thank you so much. We're gonna we the podcast, all of this information is will be on 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 Jesus Unchained page, St. Mark Facebook page, or YouTube channel. You can go back and look at the comments, gather the information about the podcast, the book for colored girls who have considered politics. I also want to encourage you to go check out Kai Green at Kai Green Speaks, doing amazing stuff on his podcast. And uh, we love you all and uh pray stay safe and uh let's stay grounded in hope. Good night. Good night.